uh, welcome to the concluding keynote conversation of this year's conference. My name is Edis Bosch. I'm a journalist and associate professor at Riga Stadens University. Delighted to be back with, with all of you. Our conversation this year is again with someone uh, with a wealth uh, of experience in European politics, and I'm yeah, truly looking forward to this. Uh, Martin Schulz is with us, president of the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung, uh, formerly party chairman of the SPD, the chancellor candidate in the elections of 2017, and of course, uh, a veteran of the European Parliament, where he served as president for two unprecedented terms from 2012 to 2017. Uh, we actually don't have a lot of time. Uh, therefore, I'll announce the housekeeping rules for the for the participants and for the listeners very quickly, and, and then we'll move on immediately uh, uh, as we are uh, being live streamed right at this moment already. We have, uh, if that is okay, Mrs. Schultz, with you, uh, 45 minutes at our disposal. Uh, and my conversation then uh, with Mr. Schultz, I'm saying this to the audience, will last approximately 30 minutes, but we want to be interactive. We want to include our audience. It is not going to uh, happen uh, in, a, in a kind of live way with, uh, with anyone, um, you know, uh, switching, connecting to our Zoom conversation. But we have all of those interactive tools at our disposal that have been available for, for the duration of this conference. So. Uh, members of the audience, if there are questions, keep them coming. They are going to be forwarded to me, and I will include them into conversation. So more or less, that's the uh, that's the battle plan for today. Once again, Mr. Schultz, thank you very much for uh, for joining us and, and and making the time for this conversation. I'd like us to uh, to take a stock of the current international situation. Well, we we have. Uh, it seems for the last two years, challenges piling up uh, one after another. And I wouldn't even actually want to kind of lock you into a, a certain, you know, very specific set of topics about the international environment. Instead, I'm actually intrigued uh, by how people who have much more direct political experience than I do, what does you keep you up at night what 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 is the your priority your most immediate concerns about what you observe in the international environment basically uh, our world seems to be in disarray mr schultz what segments of this disarray uh um worry you the most yeah, thank you very much. And first of all, I present my excuses for my delay, but I was stuck in a traffic jam and uh, therefore I was some, some minutes delayed. Um, thank you very much for the invitation and for your introduction to answer very precisely what is keeping me uh, uh, awake here during the night. I think uh, for the first time, we Europeans are uh, uh, confronted with a situation of war on the soil of the European continent uh, since uh, the end of the world war. Uh, quite sure we had uh, military confrontation uh, also in uh, the civil war in uh, Yugoslavia, in former Yugoslavia, but not to compare with um, the fact that the veto power of the Security Council of the United Nations is violating in a brutal way international rules. And what is worrying me a lot is the only place where we could find a diplomatic, uh, at least level playing field for the different uh, participants of the conflict and the potential conflict solutions could gather and discuss and come to common conclusions is blocked at the end by the aggressor. This is the Security Council, unable to act because a founding member and the member of the Security Council is leading uh, the role of the United Nations to an absurd uh, situation. The institution created uh, to uh, impose and control international rules is blocked by one of the most powerful members, breaking the respective rules. This is a situation in the multipolar, multipolar world in which we are living we need 
a coordinating, balancing center. This is normally the role of the United Nations, but the United Nations are in uh, a desperate situation. And um, this could be an encouragement uh, for other uh, brutal and aggressive regimes. Um, for the time being, it is a unique situation, but not guaranteed that not other uh, dictatorships are encouraged to do similar things and to attack uh, other countries to start uh, an aggression militarily to occupy or to destroy neighbor countries. Uh, the second thing I'm very worried about is uh, that the uh, Europeans, uh, the Western world, the United States of America, Canada, the European countries, the NATO member states, uh, defending in an overwhelming majority uh, common principles and values are more and more isolated in a world where um, other systems are openly arguing against our uh, principles, against our constitutional thinking, against our humanitarian approach to solution, finding for complex uh, problems and that we are losing as a community of democracy called support amongst those countries who are not dictatorships, who are more or less uh, democracies in a similar frame acting like we do, but not definitively at the end on our side. South Africa, for example, Brazil, for example, India, for example, the BRICS countries, I'm not speaking about China and uh, the Russian Federation, but the other member states of the BRICS um, are partially like we are on which is concerning, on what is concerning their constitutions, but they are in no way sharing our view on Russia. And, um, you could see in the vote for uh, the resolutions in the United Nations General Assembly that there was an overwhelming majority voting with the Western world against that aggression. But some of the countries I just mentioned abstained. Uh, a lot of African countries, a lot of Asian countries. And if we will not achieve to keep these countries and big ones, Indonesia, Brazil, India, uh, some of the important African countries on our side, if the Russians and the Chinese achieve to influence them against what they call their campaign against the Western world, which is at the campaign against our values, then we will have a lot of problems. And these are the two elements worrying me most for the time being. Thank you very much, sir, for 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 that overview. Uh, the first point you mentioned, I'm, I'm so um, I'm thinking of a follow up uh, to that. So, if the United the United Nations Security Council system is in disarray, and one of the uh, veto wielding members is uh, supposed to be one of the cornerstones of the order, is actually uprooting the order. What, what is the answer to that? What, what, is, what remains to be done? I, I don't know. I know this is a million dollar question, right? But nevertheless, it perhaps mm -hmm. needs to be uh, returned to because it is so crucial, right? So systemic, a question. So uh, perhaps there are two ways uh, to go about it, to try and come up with an alternative system, or perhaps the alternative is to, uh, uh, to acknowledge that that order is is dysfunctional and um, revert back to a more geopolitical uh, kind of approach to dealing uh, to uh, to maintaining to developing these relationships right based on deterrence and all of these old um, power politics rules 
uh, that were so instrumental before we seem to have something resem uh, resembling a rules-based order. So how do you imagine the way forward? First of all, the uh, fundamental, uh, thank you very much for the description, one million question. Uh, this is completely uh, uh, right. Um, nevertheless, we are obliged to, to give an answer to that question or to the two questions, the two different options you described. Uh, therefore, my answer is the first is we have to uh, decide from a fundamental point of view is the time of the United Nations, is the time of a rule, the attempt at least to install, to create a rule based world order over or not? Is this definitively finished? Or are we convinced that it makes sense to continue with that idea? I belong to those who think, yes, this is absolutely more than ever necessary to stick to the idea of the United Nation as the frame in which different continents, different groups of countries can balance their very heterogeneous interests. That was the idea of the United Nations after the Second World War, with one main goal, to avoid military confrontation at the end of different strategies and opinions and systems. Um, there is uh, the other uh, possibility to say yes, this is over. We don't need a, such a in functional, not fun functional system. This functionality is uh, a synonymous for the United Nations. Therefore, we don't need it. And let's do these things, uh, our relations, on the basis of a national level. America first. This is Trumpism. And uh, uh, in my eyes, uh, the thinking, the superpowers decide about the faith of the next generations by creating a kind of competition or cooperation in case of necessity, cooperation or confrontation between the superpowers in the world. Who are the superpowers still to define? But for one thing is sure, the United States, from a military and economic point of view, quite clear. China, absolutely clear. India in the foreseeable time also. And uh, some of the other uh, BRICS countries, if they stick together, the European Union, perhaps, if they are united, and then we, we will see what will happen. This is the thinking of a lot of uh, people like Trump or his advisors. Um, this is, in my eyes, leading sooner or later to a military confrontation, to war. And therefore, we need a reform of the United Nations to overcome the dysfunctionality of the United Nations. And uh, you will immediately ask me how to do it. My answer is to reform at uh, a first step uh, the Security Council, uh, because the permanent five with their veto in the Security Council, this is a structure of the, uh, of the post Second World War. This is now 78 years, 79 years ago. What we need is the inclusion of African and Asian powers, Indonesia, for example. India, for example, Brazil, for example, Latin America, playing a key role. We have to enlarge those countries to have a say in international legally binding solutions. And uh, therefore, I uh, recommend to fight for an enlargement uh, of the Security Council with more veto powers and the structure of, of not more veto powers, excuse me, with other kind of votes in the Security Council, perhaps with the majority vote instead of a veto vote. Well, thank you for this uh, global systemic view. I mean, this would be a fascinating conversation to explore further, uh, but I'm afraid we're going to take the whole evening to do that uh, if we attempted to do it properly. Therefore, I wanted to turn to another topic 
um, perhaps, uh, you know, switching from the climbing down from the global order um, to to European politics and, and to German uh, uh, Germany's central role uh, in, uh, in in what happens in the continent. Um, it's been two years. Uh, well, since the since the outbreak of the full fledged Russian invasion of Ukraine, and also two years uh, since um, announcement of the German government of the Zeitenwende of a of a new thinking of a watershed moment in um, Germany's approach to uh, international politics, to defense policy, to military policy, to 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 kind of strategic take. On its uh, on its own role in Europe, uh, in the region, uh, but also globally. Um, and I, I have to I'm I'm trying to sum up uh, about how this is being viewed from from Latvia, from the Baltics, from from Central and Eastern Europe, uh, from this you could say borderline region that has historically been a borderline region among and between the superpowers. And, and, and I think the over, overall sense is that uh, the, the, the change of thinking, the, the Zeitenwende has, has not been kind of a fully fledged exercise, even though obviously everyone acknowledges how huge this is a change uh, of mindset uh, for Germany with its own specific um, history and, and, uh, and ideas about uh, politics, uh, long established ideas, perhaps, uh, and a change in them. So basically, how would you assess uh, the, the change in German thinking, overall perception of its strategic position and responsibilities that have quite obviously, I think we can agree on that, changed after February uh, 2022? What has been the trajectory there, in your view? Yeah, I think this was the most uh, uh, dramatic change in German foreign policy uh, I witnessed during my uh, political career, during my lifetime. Um, and uh, to understand what it means, Zeitenwende, it makes sense to have a look on German history. Uh, um, the a relationship between Germany and the Russian Federation or the former Soviet, Soviet Union was a very specific one. And uh, I uh, think we should remember that uh, most of the atrocities of the Nazi regime and this uh, mass murder strategy of uh, the Nazis happened in Eastern Europe. Um, 20 million uh, citizens of the former and soldiers of the former Soviet Union were killed. Most of them, by the way, in uh, the territory of Ukraine of today. Um, I mentioned that because uh, to understand the very uh, specific relationship of Germany, uh, also West Germany, uh, after the Second World War, to Russia, to the Soviet Union, it was a result of that uh, of this dark uh, history of uh, Germany between 33 and 45. And one thing is uh, often underestimated and forgotten: when the German, when the Iron Curtain fall, when the uh, Berlin Wall uh, was laid down, the Soviet Union was still existing, and it was uh, Gorbachev who agreed. For, that Germany uh, was reunified and Germany could remain a member of NATO. That was not clear at the beginning. Uh, at the beginning, the uh, Soviet Union insisted on neutrality of Germany. And at the end, Gorbachev, we all know by economic reasons and because he got a lot of money, uh, and the coal, uh, then coal government agreed with them about money also for uh, the Soviet Union already very weak in that moment. But nevertheless, it was a Soviet Union leader who accepted German unification and uh, 
the remaining reunified uh, Germany remaining in the Western Bloc. And that led in the 90s and in the beginning of uh, the new century to a very specific German-Russian relationship. Um, I want to remember the relationship not only between Schroeder and Putin, which is mentioned often today, but between uh, Gorbachev and Kohl, and later between Yeltsin and Kohl. This is a little bit already forgotten, but it created a kind of very constructive mutual understanding between uh, Russia and uh, Germany. And that made it for Germans very difficult to see that one of those partners uh, became transformed themselves in an aggressive uh, war, uh, bringing hostile power. And that the German chancellor spoke therefore about Seitenman this is a deep break. And we must uh, also take into account, we have to consider that our previous relationship, our previous close partnership is finished, definitively. This is now not a partner, it is uh, uh, an aggressor against whom we have to defend ourselves and our neighbors. And I think what Germany did since then, since these two years, is enormous. We are the second donor of, uh, by the way, weapons and money behind the United States of America. And uh, I think, therefore, it was a difficult uh, change, but a necessary one. <laughs> Thank you very much for this reflection. I mean, it's always, um, always, I think, very valuable uh, to discuss these um, different regional perspectives. Obviously, we, uh, our view of the world and view of our neighbors and of those relationships is very much affected by by where we are, right? So, um, at the same time, I, I though. Obviously, I cannot hold you responsible for what uh, the government does, right? Uh, but these are your party members uh, uh, who are in charge now. So, uh, and you have a sense, having been a uh, for for a very long time a, a member of uh, of the Social Democratic Party. I mean, you have a sense of of the individuals of the overall uh, narrative. Um, would you say that? You described it as a, a, a switch in German thinking about Russia that has occurred. But obviously there are, I mean, different political ideologies, different political parties, uh, different also histories of political parties and their foreign policy agendas. Um, would you say that the change in the SPD thinking, in the Social Democrats thinking, has also been kind of fully fledged? Or is this still a work in progress? I expected your question. <laughs> Quite My clear. apologies. <laughs> no, 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 it's absolutely clear. There is no single member of uh, the German uh, parliament, of our parliamentarian group, or the leadership of our party, or in the government, doubting about uh, the necessity to support with all our means Ukraine, to support our partners within the European Union and in NATO, like your country, uh, with common borders uh, to Russia, against any kind of Russian aggression. The major change in Germany in, in my party is, yes, we had uh, and we have during a long period, and we have still today, the principle that war is always uh, the last uh, thing uh, in political life. But once a war is started by an aggressor, you are obliged to defend yourself. And uh, nevertheless, you are, as a democratic country, and we as a democratic party, always obliged always to think about the alternative to war. 
this presumption because we discuss also diplomatic strategies should be or is a signal of the German Social Democrats that we uh, are on the way to leave from the way to support Ukraine and our neighbors with all our means until the war and the aggressor is pushed back. The war is finished by Russia has to stop that aggression and to withdraw from Ukraine. One thing is not excluding the other thing. Therefore, to answer to your question, in my party, there is no doubt about our duty to support those who are uh, under Russian aggression or are running the risk to be aggressed by Russia. Our party leader, Lars Klingbeil, made it absolutely crystal clear. Um, but I belong also to those uh, German politicians as uh, president of the Ebert Foundation. This is also my duty to discuss uh, what will happen after the war. Russia, even I hope that the war will finish uh, very soon with the victory of Ukraine, but Russia will remain to be a country existing. How to deal with a post-war scenario? I think we should discuss this already now. And um, to check out if uh, there are diplomatic solutions possible uh, is absolutely necessary. I underline never without the Ukrainians and never against them or sidelining the Ukrainian government. But nevertheless, we have to check what are the options, what are the possibilities. I see for the time being no chance for peaceful development because Putin is a war criminal who uh, wants to win and we have to avoid that events. The problem, honestly, uh, I want to add is not the German Social Democratic Party. The problem is Trump and his people in Washington. Uh, and uh, therefore, I'm, I'm from time to time a little bit surprised about the debate about our uh, party. Chancellor Scholz is also a member of the German Social Democratic Party. And I think there is no doubt about the clear stance and the commitment of Olaf Scholz to uh, support the Ukraine. Thank you. <clears throat> Can I just go on a little bit uh, in, in, in detail with this? Um, you, you mentioned we, we need to, there, there is a, obviously there is a sense of, uh, of thinking about the post, post-war order. Uh, and I and I gather from your reflections that you see no chance in that as long as uh, Putin is in charge. Did I understand you correctly? Absolutely. There is, as long as the regime of Putin is ruling Russia, I can't see any sensation of movement in a direction of uh, of, of of a peaceful solution. I think he has decided for himself and his regime uh, that the Ukraine has no right of existence. And this is uh, already this is an important break of international rules. It was the Russian Federation recognizing the territorial integrity of Ukraine in the best Budapest memorandum. And I think a very important uh, point was that the government of Ukraine in that moment gave all the nuclear weapons back yeah. to Russia. Very important point, often underestimated, because for China, for example, in their uh, plan, the Chinese half a year ago suggested point 10, I believe, or nine of this uh, enumeration of Chinese proposal was already the threat to use nuclear weapons is inadmissible. It was a very important signal. And I can tell you, not at least uh, by German influence in Beijing, the Chinese made it crystal clear that uh, their cooperation 
with Russia will be ended, will finish, will be finished, if they continue to think about nuclear uh, power, nuclear forces. Mm. So um, I think he decided to go ahead to destroy Ukraine. And as long he is uh, on that path and in power, I see no chance. It could take years, it could take tens of years uh, until the regime in Russia evol evolves into something different. In the meantime, um, perhaps, well, quite clearly, the answer is that you know, we, we must stand strong. We need to rely on deterrence. Deterrence means, well, it doesn't mean obviously uh, seizing communication uh, per se, but it means being militarily strong and, and credible. Um, obviously with the, uh, with the election in the United States and, and all that debate, um, doesn't make it easier but it's also not not being made easier by by the fact that uh germany is not used to being a military power right um and and perhaps in the in the years to come with the oh by the way uh germany has this year reached the two percent threshold right uh in defense spending uh which is a which is a good development but wouldn't you agree that in order to be credible and prepared uh perhaps even german military expenditures need to be you know the two percent threshold is already a thing of the past that it needs to be much much higher in order to maintain credible deterrence um but at the same time obviously it will come into conflict as in every you know, democratic society with other kinds of expenditures. I mean, the social Democrats, that, that's the definition of social democracy, that the welfare state is at the forefront of politics, right, of, of the state's duties towards its citizens. Um, do you see that the, the, the in Germany, in, in your internal debate, uh, you know, the, the necessary balance between those requirements of military expenditures, being militarily credible, at the same time, maintaining the, the other, the focus on other policies without which um, no government can maintain uh, credibility and, and authority for long and remain in office. Can, can that be achieved? Is that challenge that you are confident can be surmounted. I was always very skeptical about uh, this uh, artificial uh, figure, 2%. When I ran uh, for the chancery, I said always, why 2%? Why not 4%? Why not 3 or 1.75? Why 2% of the GDP? I found that this was a figure uh, as other figures, but I asked where is, what is the goal, what is the content, and what should we do with the money? Okay, we agreed about the 2%, uh, Germany now uh, spending the 2%, other countries are spending more, Poland I think is on the way to spend 4%, but well, let's be honest, 2% of the German GDP is a, a lot of money. And we had this 100 billion exclusive program announced with the Zeit and Wende in addition to the 2%. And Germany is financing, I think the figure is around 17 billion euros during the last two years, directly to Ukraine. And if you uh, take, for example, the Czech initiative of the last weeks, uh, as far as I'm informed, around 40% of the money needed for the check-in initiatives coming from Germany. So if you add all these elements, Germany is spending much more than the 2% of our GDP for uh, uh, military measures and 
for defense measures uh, in Europe. I think once more, Germany is not the problem. In Germany, it's quite clear and it is sustainable that we want to, um, uh, to maintain and to increase our capacity to defend ourselves and our neighbors. This is the central role of Germany. I think in your neighbor country, uh, Lithuania, we have already a lot of German soldiers now. But um, the uh, question you raised, if people are uh, seduced to play by political, tactical reasons, the welfare state against defense spending, our societies will be divided uh, in a dramatic way. If ordinary citizens have the feeling super rich people pay nothing and I have to pay for Ukraine, uh, then we will lose the necessary support we need. Um, and um, this is not only a German problem. Look to Poland. Uh, if you discuss with Polish agriculture about uh, agriculture in uh, Ukraine and yeah, not necessary to continue. You, you know about what I'm speaking. So what we need is social coherence in those countries who are obliged to invest a lot in the security of Ukraine and our Eastern uh, neighbors. And therefore, uh, to play uh, military spendings, the 2% against the welfare state is absolutely stupid. Okay, um, this is once again a conversation that, uh, you know, I, I really enjoyed talking to you and I would really like to uh, spend so much more time on this, but I promise that I, I will involve the questions from the audience as well. So I have to stop my own questions uh, right at the moment where I, I seem to have uh, uh, getting into my my head uh, qu quite a lot of good ones, but I nevertheless <laughs> have to have to switch to what is coming in from the audience. Um, there are at least two or three I have uh, selected that I think we'll have time to cover. And one of them is, is related to the issue uh, that uh, you touched upon, but nevertheless, this is in reference to, um, to a letter, I think it was an internal letter sent from prominent historians, SPD, by the way, historians, who criticized the chancellor's policy and who wrote, uh, if the chancellor and the party leadership draw red lines, not for Russia, but exclusively for German politics, I think was in reference to the Taurus debate, uh, they will sustainably weaken German security policy and play into Russia's hands. So the question here is, have not the uh, German government uh, drawn too many red lines for themselves instead of drawing red lines for Russia? Yeah, my answer is I disagree with the letter of the historians. I read it very carefully. I know, I know a lot of uh, those uh, uh, colleagues and friends who signed it and I underline uh, some of them are very, really close friends. Uh, I find the debate um, meaningful because it gives uh, the chancellor and the leadership of the party the, clary the chance to clarify. I can't see red lines for Ukraine. I repeat once more. Uh, the uh, Zeitenwende philosophy of Olaf Scholz is we support Ukraine as long it is necessary. And that means as long also Ukraine considers it necessary. Listen, this is a very far reaching decision of a government to say, this is not only a unilateral decision by Germany, what we are doing, this is always in a close cooperation and a common decision making with the government in Kiev. So to delegate the kind of the decision making about what is necessary to Kiev is a very important point. What we did and what Chancellor Scholz did in the past is one thing, never without the Americans, always in agreement with the Biden government in Washington. This is very important because if Germany is acting alone and the Russians 
have the uh, impression this is not coordinated with Washington. This is, in our eyes, a much higher risk than uh, uh, a lot of people uh, perceive. And therefore, I find some of the elements uh, of the letter not justified. We are not drawing red lines against uh, Ukraine. Uh, the unconditional support of Ukraine is guaranteed. And we are drawing red lines to Russia. No single economy was more threatened by the Russians than the energy depending export economy of Germany. And what we did is uh, to cut uh, 60, 65 years lasting economic relationship with Russia from one day to another. And this was a, an enormous red line also to Russia and that we are. Uh, insisting on application of the sanctions is not drawing red lines for Ukraine, but drawing red lines to Russia. So I found some of the elements of the letter uh, not uh, justified. Yeah, um, I think we can fully agree with uh, with the fact that that really switching away from the energy dependence on on the Russian gas was a truly remarkable. I mean, even for our, I mean Latvian standards as well. But we are obviously a different size and a different economy. But a dependence that for Germany has been elaborate. I mean, strengthened, uh, built over a half more than a half century of you know pipelines and and the economic model uh, that has been a, a transformational thing. You think that's irreversible? You never know uh, if one day uh, Russia should be a democracy and uh, uh, credible partner, we, we, we should return to cooperation with Russia. But uh, I repeat, I can't imagine this in the foreseeable time. Okay, two more questions and then, and then we're out of time, I believe, um, from the audience. If you could elaborate just a little bit on what you think could be done additionally on the European level. There has been a, a conversation about perhaps uh, creating something in the next European Commission resembling European Armaments uh, Commissioner or something like that. Uh, obviously, we have had you know, 50 years of conversation of what the European Un Union could do as a defense and security policy actor, and it has been <laughs> a never-ending conversation. But nevertheless, this is this seems to be something practical and maybe, maybe even doable. What your experience with European Union politics, particularly in integration and in such sensitive fields as, as military industries, does this seems to you something that could be doable and worthwhile? Absolutely, yeah. Um... I agree with your question, which is already an answer. Yes, this is absolutely necessary that the European uh, countries, I'm in favor of a defense commissioner in Brussels and uh, to coordinate uh, arms production and to avoid uh, this, uh, this parallelity we have uh, in, 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 in the different kind of, of uh, uh, arms provide to our armies and uh, the the incompatibility we have with different systems. We are spending a lot of money, but some of the systems are incompatible, which is a, absolutely uh, a disaster, let's be honest, in the times in which we are living, leading to the fact that uh, some of the experts told me we are mobilizing a lot of money, but we have no own production on the European soil. And we have to buy this worldwide check initiative, you remember, and we have to spend the money to the United States to get the armament we need for Ukraine, because we Europeans are unable, we pay it, but we are unable to provide them with the necessary instruments that must be finished. And therefore, yes, to coordinate better, uh, therefore, we need a common uh, strategy in Brussels, in the European Union. But one thing is very important. This is not enough. Looking to the fact that the United States of America, even with a democratic president, will not maintain and continue, I'm not speaking about Trump, 
speaking, for example, about Barack Obama, who spoke about we are a Pacific nation. I'm a Pacific president. That the transatlantic relationship is not longer the exclusive uh, relation of the United States, that they are looking to other parts of the world, oblige the European members of NATO, who are in the same time members of the European Union, to coordinate them more than they do politically, economically, and militarily within NATO as Europeans. And uh, therefore, I think a commissioner should have that uh, duty to coordinate the common uh, security and defense policy of the European Union also as an element of NATO strategy, as a European part of NATO, a European strong pillar under the roof of NATO. And uh, therefore, the answer to your question is, we need more European cooperation. But I want to add one element. You need in uh, most of the foreign policies and security questions unanimity within the European Council. Viktor Orban, Robert Fizzo, the Austrian government. I don't want to continue, but you know about what I'm speaking. Marine Le Pen as a perhaps president of France. So we have a lot of problems within the European Union. And believe me, one of the strategies of the German government is to assure that these people, these governments, will not step away from the European Union. To keep them on board is one of the backgrounds of a lot of activities of Olaf Scholz. Because if the Russians achieve to split us in these questions, and this is what they want to do, then we have a lot of problems. Therefore, once more, uh, the letter of these uh, colleagues, historians, is, for, for example, not taking into account the internal risks of the European Union. extremely salient, uh, I think, end of our conversation and, and, and throughout the conversation. Um, we're out of time. Therefore, uh, I will just have one concluding question and then an expression of, uh, of, of, uh, of pity that truly we don't have more time. But my concluding question to you is, in this time of disarray and, and, and we, we superficially touched upon a, a, a huge number of challenges facing us and the more we you know discuss those challenges the more challenges kind of uh, came to us as as ideas that even more complicated things do you see any uh, kind of any positivity in all of this in the in the experience of the last couple of years is there anything good uh, anything optimistic that you see on the horizon as well that you can share with us, hopefully? Very difficult, very difficult question. Um, that the Europeans at the end uh, kept the common line against Russia and an increasing number of citizens uh, discuss that it is better to live in a democracy than in an authoritarian system. That people understand that people like, that systems like the Russian one um, is incompatible with what an overwhelming majority of people of the Western world wants to have as the basis of their daily life. Freedom, uh, self-determination, mutual respect, tolerance, dignity, instead of lack of respect, intolerance, and no dignity for individuals. Uh, the war showed, I think, to an uh, increasing number of people that peace and a peaceful society 
is better than what the Russians or the Chinese offer us as their system. Therefore, I have hoped that at the end, the Democrats, because our democracies, with the support of the Russians, as we just in these days see in Germany that members of the German parliament are paid by Russian propaganda uh, organizations, uh, that they try even to, to, to uh, destroy us from inside, our democracy from inside, that uh, in Germany I saw never in the last 20 years such a kind of mobilization in favor of our democracy than during the last month. This is a hopeful, this is a signal of hope. I think it is very important to recognize and, and, and to see the rays of light in this darkness as well. And I, I, I'm, I'm thankful that we can conclude on, on this note. Uh, Martin Schultz, very, we're, we were honored uh, that you joined us today and, and, uh, and participated in this concluding keynote conversation for our conference today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good luck. Take care. Good luck.